Libations Friday. Good to be with you. As always, I think most of us are in a good mood today. Hell, I'm even in a good mood in day two of my COVID run. That's why I'm here at the house and Tom is in studio. But hey, we're getting better. Things are moving in the right direction, I do believe. And the same can be said right now as far as Florida State baseball goes and really just a general feel for the athletic department, the upcoming season, and uh, reasons to be excited. So this morning, if you missed it right off the bat, let me plug some things. First of all, I'll thank you for being here as always. If you're listening on 93.3 Real Talk Radio, appreciate that. Obviously, if you're listening on War Chant TV, make sure you go ahead and like and subscribe. All that good stuff that helps us reach more people, helps out the station, helps out the website as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, this morning we did a video, Tom, where we – Welcome to Link Jared in as the new head coach at Florida State. And, you know, I think I think a couple of things stand out here. We, we've talked about that, um, how important it's been to get that hire done, uh, how important it was for Mike Alford, the new athletic director, to uh, hit a home run here. Uh, it, it, obviously, baseball is not football, uh, but people do care about it passionately, and this was an obvious candidate with all of the connections you could possibly want to Florida State University, given that he grew up here, of course, played here and was an All-American here and then wanted this job, wanted to coach here, has uh, made that abundantly clear and then goes off and becomes the coach that he has become, which is meaning, you know, you think about his success at UNC Greensboro, you think about the success that he had at Notre Dame, it's all lined up to this day. And so all you had to do was make it happen and don't drop the ball. And Michael Alford did just that. And Florida State got their guy. I think the other thing that really stands out to me here, and we'll get into the larger ramifications. A couple things. A, that video from earlier this morning, once the announcement was made by Florida State, is up on Warchant.com and on Warchant TV if you want to go find it on YouTube. The other thing is I don't think uh, – and, and, and you can tell that there is a mindset, a collective mindset amongst Florida State fans. You see it a lot on Twitter, but you certainly see it on the boards and you see it in interactions. And that is this feeling that Florida State doesn't have a fighting chance if other schools who they deem to have more money uh, than them um, it, it are involved. And, and that's simply not true. Florida State still has a lot of cachet. Uh, this baseball program is infinitely superior to that of Notre Dame's. And as long as they were competitive, Florida State was always going to get Link Jarrett. I saw a lot of people say, oh, this won't be uh, a, a fight that Florida State can win. And again, I think that reveals that that mindset, you know, that that Florida State is not in the running uh, in big time athletics for elite level coaches and players uh, because of the direction that college of athletics have gone. It's just not true. Now, are there people that you can't beat out if it becomes solely about the money? Yeah, sure. There are a lot of schools that uh, have more money, richer alumni etc. Um, but, but you know, it's not always just about the money. And moreover, Florida State isn't broke. They're getting out from under the Willie Taggart situation. Uh, they're starting to, to come into a situation where they have more money to fight uh, these fights with. And moreover, again, it's a desirable place to be, man. Florida State's place in college baseball history is uh, still up there amongst the elite programs. And so I'm glad Link Jarrett now is at the helm the opportunity to cash in on those advantages. It's a seven-year deal, we're told. So obviously that is a commitment. Throw in the mix that Link is back where he grew up, back where he played, and back to a program that he has a lot of passion for, loves, and knows a lot about. The ins and outs, all those relationships, the state of Florida, the ability to recruit here. I think he'll do a great job. Seemed like a slam dunk hire. And today that happened. And it manifests itself really quickly, too. They didn't wait around. This didn't get drawn out in a way that made everybody uncomfortable. Um, you know, the timeline was what you would have expected it to be for a man who was competing out in Omaha. His team gets eliminated. He's able to say goodbye to his players, able to thank the people he needed to thank at Notre Dame, and then turn his attention to a much better job, which is the Florida State job. And it is a much better job than most places, not just Notre Dame, a much better job than most places around the country. Now, it'll be curious, and I think the answer is going to be yes, this is a guess on my part, that not only have you made the commitment to Link Jarrett, 
you've clearly made the commitment to baseball by doing that, which tells me that there will be changes for Florida State baseball for the positive above and beyond the coach. I think that they'll invest in the stadium. Uh, I don't know what the future plans for Hauser are, but obviously it needs a massive facelift, if not uh, a total destruction and rebuild. We'll see what happens. But I do think that you don't make this move to commit the money in the long-term years on that contract to link Jarrett without making an overall commitment to baseball that allows that guy to succeed. You don't just bring him in here and say, overcome these things that obviously will be used against you in recruiting. You bring him in here, you lock him in and say, okay, we're going to make some changes here. We're going to make it easier for you to win those recruiting battles because you've, you've signaled that you're committed to baseball. Good news. Yeah. Conversely, I'd say that Link Jarrett doesn't commit to Florida State unless he gets assurances that those things are going to happen. His stock could not be higher across the country, and he could have stood pat if he didn't hear what he wanted to hear from Florida State, remained at Notre Dame for another season, and his resume wouldn't have been tarnished no matter what happens next year. So to me, either way you look at it, if you make this higher, you're making a commitment to baseball. Uh, if you're going to accept the job and take on the job at Florida State, if you're Link Jarrett, who's in a position of power right now, you're not going to do so without assurances. So it's a good day across the board. And again, you know, as a Noel fan who's seen a lot of hirings get botched or situations with simple PR matters get botched, it was nice to have a clean one. This was a clean exchange, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't think people know what to do with themselves. That includes those of us who cover the program. Like half the time you see these things play out and you're like, well, what's going to go wrong here? What's going to get ugly? Nothing got ugly here. This was as straightforward as it comes. They identified their candidate early on once the decision was made to part ways with Mike Martin Jr. I think that's where you have to start, by the way. You have to start with Michael Alford having the kind of power that other ADs haven't had post Dave Hart. This has come to fruition now because, uh, you know, I've talked about this for years. I've talked about the bungling of situations within the athletic department because of the lack of continuity um, in terms of who's in charge, who has power, who doesn't. You've had university presidents that were de facto athletic directors. You've had athletic directors whose hands were tied even when they wanted to make a move because of the booster situation. You had a lot of things that were convoluted, disjointed, and certainly not modern. Once you modernized the way that athletics works and the way that you tie in athletics with the boosters, and once you brought in an athletic director to actually be an athletic director and make decisions about hirings and firings in the direction of athletics in general, you wanted to see how quickly that would impact the way Florida State did business. So that's why I say let's circle back to that first move. It's very important. Um, the first thing you do is that you identify a problem and then you want to get to the bottom of that problem. And, and, and get to the, the, the root of that problem, get to the bottom of the issue, if you will. And so, you know, the fact that that happened so quickly on the heels of um, the, the, the bouncing, if you will, once Florida State was uh, removed from the postseason uh, by losing uh, at Auburn in the regional, uh, once that happened, you know, obviously this all wrapped up. If you look at the timeline, it wrapped up very quickly. Uh, and, and it began, I think, with the matter of Clemson throwing their name in the hat to care about baseball again. Clemson decided they wanted to spend some money. They wanted to make a move in college baseball. They identified their candidate at the time to be Link Jarrett. And I think that when that got out, obviously that might have sped up the timeline a little bit, but Florida State did not wait around. Florida State, uh, I am told, reached out to representatives uh, for Link Jarrett, understanding that, hey, uh, you know, give us give us a moment here. We're figuring some things out, but don't be hasty. Um, we're, we're interested. And once he determined that they were going to part ways with Mike Martin Jr., uh, I think the full court press was put on. I don't think there's any question they went hard after Link Jared in that moment. Uh, and, they, and they did so in good faith. There were no Mickey Mouse offers, no nonsense. It was straight to the point. And, and, and now you see how that can work, how efficient that can be. That's a good sign. They did the same when they extended Lonnie Alameda. Uh, and I think that uh, if you go back and look, the situation with soccer was a unique one. Uh, that became a situation that was not driven by money. Uh, if it had been driven by money, then I would have second guesses uh, as to this process yet again. But it wasn't. That was a personality conflict, unfortunately. Don't need to relitigate that. Just know that they offered Mark Krikorian the most amount of money of any soccer coach in America, and he turned it down. So the point would be, 
money hasn't been a problem. Identifying problems and then seeking to solve them has not been a problem. Efficiency of movement have not been a problem so far for Mike Alford. That's good news for Florida State moving forward. That's good news for all of the programs moving forward. It's also perhaps something that puts assistant coaches, head coaches for all the programs on notice. Yeah, I would think so. It, it brings you closer to the meritocracy we would all like this athletic department to be. And I'm not saying that necessarily that means that you know people weren't hired who had merit. It's just there was always something it, with a lot of these programs uh, with the longevity of the coaches, whether it's, you're talking about Bobby or Eleven or Sue Semrau or you know, we were lucky. That's one thing that we were lucky for at Florida State was to have long term coaches entrenched, building traditions and excelling. But there was always a subtext underneath it, too, that sometimes, well, they've been around here forever. So can you really make a move? This seems like we're getting closer to the day where we are more of a mercenary type athletic department. Now, I say that on the one hand, but on the other hand, if you look at the negotiations so far with either Kikorian who left or the others who've been extended or elevated or outright hired, these negotiations seem to be in good faith, which is a good thing. We've got to repair our reputation, too. That's the other thing that's going on here, because if you want good people to come work at this athletic department, not just as a head coach or an assistant coach, but in the athletic offices, you've got to show that you're a person of your word and that this is a place that you can succeed and elevate and grow and receive more money if you do all of those things. And we're getting to a place where I think in the community of athletic directors and athletic folks in NCAA sports, we're getting closer to where our reputation is in a better place, which is a good thing because it creates better candidates for you moving forward. Well, if you wanted to get even more uh, improved reputationally, uh, you got to go out and win some football games. And so now we can collectively turn our attention to football, which is what most people want to do anyhow. Obviously, we are in the part of the summer that gets really exceedingly difficult for all. Not only is it uncomfortably hot, excruciatingly so, frustratingly so, as Full you can stop. tell. On my, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, not only is that the case, people are on their vacations. Uh, you know, we've wrapped up the NBA draft. I've got some thoughts on that, by the way, in a moment. Uh, a sad night for uh, for John Butler, who got terrible advice. And um, it, it came as no surprise that his name was not called amongst the 58 people that were drafted. Normally 60, but two picks were forfeited because of uh, tampering. But bottom line is uh, 58 picks came and went. No John Butler's name uh, called. That's not a shock. I'll get back to these in a moment. That said, uh, that's now in the rear view. The championship having been won by Golden State, the draft concluded. Obviously, Florida State doesn't open football camp until July. Uh, you've got a situation similarly with a lot of these NFL camps not opening up till then. And we're at a place now where obviously baseball is wrapping up uh, in college. You're in the middle of the season in professional baseball. And now Florida State's made a hire at that end. And so this is truly the little dead time. So or everybody begins to sink their teeth into whatever publication, whatever outlet, whatever preview they choose to try to look at. Usually that's multifaceted uh, to try to get back up to speed with college and pro football, right? That's where our head turns. This is where it happens. Now we begin to salivate once July comes around and this year, even more Tom, because obviously camps begin sooner and our camp in particular in Florida state begins sooner with the earlier start to the season. And I think we're going to need it. We're going to need it. Not just because that's great content for a talk show, not just uh, because it's great to, to, to talk football when, as soon as you possibly can. But, but I think because people have been anxious and on edge and the hand wringing has begun because there's a chance to be a significantly better football team this year. There's also the very real possibility that they don't take the step forward. There's some, some feeling of limbo here that you're nervous about because you know how important the season is. And, and so the sooner we can get to it, I think most people are ready to. Yeah. The thing I'd say to, to boost everybody's spirits, cause you're right. It is entering the, the dead time here next week, this time next week, it's July this time next week. It is the month in which football camp starts. And not NFL training camps, because usually that's for the NFL and not for us. But because we're up by a week, yeah. we'll prepare for Duquesne on the 27th. And prepare we will for the mighty Duquesne Dukes. That will be the month of football camp. So this offseason is a little bit shorter this year. I've said it before. If we could just have a week zero matchup every year, I would take it. <laughs> it affords you the new the second bye week. Like whatever you have to do to be even like it was uh, with South Carolina and Spurrier for so many years where they opened up on a Thursday night in week one. 
Whatever you've got to do to give yourself that extra time, that's great because it's also good for us in the media because it gets real sooner and it's about to get real. So I'm getting excited. Yeah, the next thing that happens for us, obviously, um, is an opportunity to go to Charlotte and we get started with the ACC kickoff. There were some football interviews today. I want to get to that. I do want to circle back to what I just mentioned here and talk about John Bettler failing to be drafted and how, how difficult it's going to be for him. I won't dwell on that long. We will we will take a cursory glance at the draft. By the way, I have a fun angle. It is a loosey-goosey, no matter how under the weather I feel. It is a loosey-goosey edition, Libations Friday edition of the Jeff Cameron Show. So I can point out, by the way, Tom, that not only was last night, um, on the one hand, if we're going to bring it back home, a little disappointing uh, for, for John Butler, but it was a huge betting night, and Woj screwed up the lines on uh, the top three picks in the draft, and some of the Sharks out in Vegas really did well. And it's kind of an interesting side note, sidebar to the draft, that this has become a thing. Uh, the order in which the first five picks go is a huge betting prop now. And Woj has so much influence. Obviously, it's in the vernacular now. The common sportsman vernacular of Woj bomb is a thing. He tweeted out 24 hours earlier the order he thought it was going to go based on his sources. And, of course, he got it wrong. And by getting it wrong, he cost a lot of people a lot of money. I'm going to get to it momentarily. It's kind of a funny story. Jeff Cambridge, 93.3 Real Talk Radio, War Chant TV. This is Kyle, service manager from Barano Heating and Air. Schedule an appointment from your mobile device to learn about our total comfort service program. With guaranteed same-day service, 15% off necessary repairs, and $25 berry books to use towards air filters and other products. Turn to the experts at Carrier and Barano Heating and Air. Any day, anytime, anywhere. Online at baranoac.com. Florida license, CAC 1816-186. Witten Glass has been taking care of families since 1945. Experienced, reliable professionals who offer only the best, like Widden's top-of-the-line bath enclosures. Eye-catching storefronts are a specialty at Widden Glass, and they provide precise installation. Widden Glass, Tallahassee's first family in glass. Online at WiddenGlass.com. Call 850-222-5781. Hi, my name is Shannon Pash, and I'm the principal at Red Hills Academy. We will provide a challenging, rigorous curriculum. We will also work with our students to teach them how to set goals and then how to work to reach those goals. Red Hills Academy will offer the Spanish language every day. Relationships are really important to us, not just with our students, but with our families and the community. This benefits parents and students alike because parents get that involvement within the school. Easily apply online today at redhillsacademy.com. Hi, this is Justin Colvin, founder of the Medicare Help Desk. I routinely speak to seniors who are overwhelmed by the multitude of coverage options available to them. That's why I created the Medicare Help Desk radio show. Tune in every Sunday at 11.30 a.m. where I provide clear answers to all your questions about Medicare. Hey, this is Dustin Rivas. During the pandemic, I noticed restaurants struggling with online ordering and watched as all the major third parties took advantage of our local restaurants and thought there must be a better way, which is why I created foodiestakeout.com. The unique thing about Foodies Takeout is that restaurants keep 100% of their order revenue versus splitting upwards of 30% with the third parties like Uber Eats and Bite Squad. At Foodies Takeout, you can find some of your favorite restaurants, such as Jerry's Midtown Cafe, Misty's Kitchen in Frenchtown, Casa Grande, and even El Jalisco. Or if you're on the north side of town, check out Horizons Bar and Grill. Why not give us a try? Head to foodiestakeout.com or text foodies to 230-9456, and I'll even give you 10% off your first meal. Supporting local restaurants has never been easier. Visit foodiestakeout.com. What's for dinner? Burgers? After last week? No thanks. Avoiding foods due to fear of diarrhea, gas, bloating, stomach pain, or loose oily stools? It may not be just stomach issues. It could be EPI, or exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. EPI can cause uncomfortable symptoms because it's a condition where the pancreas doesn't release enough digestive enzymes to break down food. But EPI can be managed. Use the symptom checker on identifyepi.com and talk to your doctor about your symptoms. That's identifyepi.com. Sponsored by Abby. 
Welcome back to the quickest podcast ever, brought to you by Kohl's. Today's topic, Father's Day deals. Dads can be tough to shop for. Not at Kohl's. I got my dad a shirt for just eleven oh four. Okay, that is pretty great. It gets better. You can take an extra 15% off already amazing deals, like 20% off grilling tools, and not to mention, 25% off Under Armour gear. All right, I'm sold. Oh, and you can save even more with a Kohl's card. More style and more savings? On my way there now. Select styles, 15% off items, June 19th. Under Armour coupons do not apply. Some exclusions apply. So store or Kohl's for details. We all want more energy, more strength, more results. Well, welcome to Orange Theory Fitness as you take a step towards feeling more alive today. Backed by science, Orange Theory's heart rate monitored workout is scientifically designed to keep heart rates in a target zone, spiking metabolism and increasing energy. Orange Theory Fitness is a one-of-a-kind group personal training workout resulting in more energy, visible toning, and extra calorie burn for up to 36 hours. Experience more vibrant life today with Orange Theory Fitness. To find out more, go to orangetheoryfitness.com. The Jeff Cameron Show. And we're good. Libations Friday, Lucy Goosey edition of the Jeff Cameron Show continues onward. And uh, we'll get to some of your comments, by the way, here in a moment. I saw some of you guys are noting a loss of a recruit. I will touch on that momentarily. So I said before the break that I did want to touch on the draft. Uh, and the reason being that um, not, not that Duke's Paolo Banchero went number one overall to the Orlando Magic. Good luck to him. Good luck to the Magic. They seem to need it. Um, but because uh, a rare misstep occurred, ESPN NBA insider Adrian Wojnarowski suffered uh, that misstep. He tweeted Thursday morning that it was, quote, increasingly firm that Auburn's Jabari Smith was going to go first overall. Gonzaga's Chet Holmgren would then go second and Bonchero would fall to third. He reversed course 30 minutes before the draft started when he realized he got it wrong. But alas, many were locked in and it was too late and it turned out to be a huge weekend for those who stayed the course. The betterers, if you will, got it right and it turned out to be a memorable night for sports books, betters capping what was 24 hours of um, a new day in the world of legalized U.S. sports betting, as they say, where these kinds of things now are, are increased. The handle is much bigger for drafts. And they're only going to get bigger as more and more states legalize it. And it kind of adds an extra wrinkle to watching all of these drafts because now people will bet on anything. They're going to bet on these things time and again. The baseball draft, you watched them, the NFL, obviously. I mean, it gets serious. And so if you are Woj, who gets these things right most of the time and has done a great job over the years, if you feel like that's a firm source that you got and you go with that, the day of the draft and then find out 30 minutes beforehand, man, that's a toughie. That's a big miss. Well, what a way to hedge to say increasingly firm instead of just, it's going to happen. That's, that's an interesting phrase. Uh, I'd say that betting on where somebody falls in the draft feels like a complete conflict of interest and it should never be on the boards at all. Don't you feel like that's going to be a scandal waiting to happen at some point that, you know, the right information was leaked to a certain party and it's a friend of a friend of the uh, assistant general manager's intern or something along those lines. And that's how you make some quick cash. It just I don't know, man, that, that feels like a lot of these things are predetermined and they're mothballed so that the player and the franchise can have their moment in the sun to celebrate because nothing will short circuit the PR boom that is having the number one overall pick in the NFL draft than it being common knowledge the day before, two days before. Like, you don't get to have your time in the sun, and, and that's very valuable to these franchises. So this information is out there. I just I find it interesting that these names are on the board so frequently because I feel like it's a it's a scandal waiting to happen. Well, I, I think it's not the thing that I would bet on. I I, I listen, the, the amount of misinformation and intentional BS that is floated by all of these teams prior to the draft so that they can try to manipulate perhaps offers from others. Man, I mean, it's it's crazy what ends up happening. I wouldn't I wouldn't touch that with a ten foot pole. I'm a degenerate to some extent, and certainly for a lot of people listening and watching, uh, their definition of a degenerate, I would fall in that category, I suppose. 
Yeah, I say to that every extent, to all extents, not to some extent. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't even bet on the order of the draft, and I bet on preseason football, and I did early. Um, you know, I, I, <laughs> to me, that's that's nuts. Uh, back to the more serious issue, and it's not shocking at all. I mean, I, I, I looked at, and I've been watching here since we've come on the air. I'm trying to find. All the do you have news? Do you have one news? second? No, well, I do have some news relative to the NFL preseason. I just want folks to know and write it down in their calendars that on August the 11th, the Tennessee Titans will be traveling to Baltimore to take on Coach Harbaugh and the Ravens. Right. And so he cares just, deeply. That's right. You have 10 days before the second game, but August the 11th, make sure put that reminder on your phone right now because that's when the Ravens kick off the preseason. Well, I was following, uh, you know, a lot of different trackers for the undrafted free agents, the UDFAs from this to see as we came on the air today, whether or not uh, Butler was signing uh, with somebody. Uh, and, and it hasn't happened as of the time that we came on the air. Now, if you get information otherwise, please let me know. But as we were coming on, he had not. And that is that is so frustrating. Uh, I feel bad for the kid. He clearly got terrible information. And he was not drafted last night after 58 picks went by. And now he has to try to catch on with a team as an undrafted free agent, obviously, and hope to make a roster for the NBA Summer League, which takes place July 7th through the 17th in Las Vegas. And uh, we'll see. I, th that's That has a, a sad ending written all over it, Tom. I, I have a bad feeling that, that it's not going to work out uh, at all. Uh, for, for him. And if you think about, listen, Bob Miller coming is going to help FSU overcome the loss of Miller. I agree with that. I think that's going to help us a lot. He's a more skilled player with the same length and the same height. Um, and, and so I think obviously you, you, you're excited about that. But if you think of what Miller could have done had he come back yeah, but, uh, to yeah. go along with Bob and the rest of that roster, and it is a much more friendly environment uh, to try to improve your skills and certainly pack on the pounds and change your physique. And he just didn't now, now he's going to have to do it in the cutthroat world of the, of the uh, NBA summer league. If he's lucky or overseas, we'll see. I, I wish him well, that's just a terrible decision. Yeah, I agree. Now, you know, maybe they were in a position where they needed the money sooner. I, I don't know. It sounded like there was a conflict within the camp, within the team, so to speak about what his next move was going to be, but you're right. I, I don't even know that this screams G league. This might be a Europe situation, and maybe you prove yourself because you're so young that you might get a look to come back stateside and, and play in a developmental league, and, and maybe that's your path, but it's a difficult path. It would have been a whole lot easier to stick around here and maximize your draft stock and, and take one honest crack at it. It just it felt like it was half-assed. That's what it felt like to me. Well, it, it felt like it was desperate. It felt like somebody in that camp was pushing. They did so financially, and this is what ends up happening. Uh, by the way, real quick rundown here. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, and by the way, you know what that reminded me of a little bit, by the way? Do you remember how upset we were just because, yeah, it affected Florida State negatively, uh, but it also affected uh, the player negatively, and and I can still remember you and I having this conversation um, when, when Obi Agu's handlers – uh, got a hold of him and 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 steered him away from a place that he was beginning to blossom and took him to Seton Hall where he had an undistinguished career to say the least. He averaged three points and three rebounds in 86 games and 57 starts. Uh, he must uh, that's three more points and three more rebounds a game than I had for Seton Hall over that same time period. What are we doing? Yeah, given the way that you know we could have used a rim protector, a shot alterer the next year, that he he won't be the best player like. Butler's stock could have been improved more if he came back and in, in, in terms of where he would be picked in the NBA draft board. Let's just say that Butler came back for another year or two seasons. Obiagu wouldn't have been a lottery pick or anything like that, but what he would have meant to this roster and this program and what oh, yeah. we would have been able to do that next season if Obiagu was back, I was just waiting for the payoff to come a year or two later at Seton Hall. So you say, well, okay, at least the, the kid was, you know, his handler was doing right by him. <laughs> that just never came. And that's one that actually gets me very angry. There are some situations where I'm like, well, whatever, you know, that's the kid's choice. It's what he wants to do. That one just, it felt like a, a terrible decision in the moment. And I guess 
this is another one of those that probably chalks up in that chapter. But who knows? John Butler, maybe he fills out and uh, he lights it up from three overseas. And the next thing you know, you'll see him on a bench somewhere in the NBA three or four years from now. But I'm rooting for that to happen. I think everybody's rooting for that to happen. By the way, really quickly, Gregory, I'll answer your question. No, that's not what happened here. That's not what happened here at all. Uh, This is a case, again, where some people, family members and the like wanted money. Um, And so it sucks sucks. Uh, Kid is the one who suffers. Uh, The ACC did amount to the the matchups for the upcoming ACC Big Ten Challenge while we're on the subject really quick. We get Purdue again, Tom, but the good news is they lost five starters. Thank God. (laughs) Five starters, including Ivy, who's really freaking good. So I'm glad that that dude's gone. And so is that uh, center that looks like he's from out of this world. And all, all those guys are gone. Yes, that's it. Get out of here. Fine. Maybe the ACC Big Ten Challenge will work better in our favor this time around. Uh, And then the only other thing I would note is that that Duke team had like everybody and their brother drafted. And, you know, listen, I'm just going to say this for as good a coach as, uh, as your favorite college basketball coach is, or was now that he's retired, that team doesn't win the championship with like everybody and their brother, including the bench warmers getting drafted last night. How good a coach are we coach K? I mean, good Christ. Uh, that whole starting lineup, including Wendell, Tom. Wendell got drafted. God bless him. He got drafted. Don't you blaspheme me. I'm looking at you. I see you there full screen. <laughs> Don't you blaspheme me. Yeah, I will blaspheme because that's embarrassing. I, I get it. One night, one bad night in a tournament. But, brother, your whole starting five went drafted in the first round. <laughs> it's the Jeff Cameron Show Live Patience Friday, 93.3 Real Talk Radio, War Chant TV. Your local news now. TPD arrested a man yesterday that has been associated with several recent burglaries in the area. 24-year-old John Bob Kimball III was spotted just after 6.30 a.m. in Railroad Square after a groundskeeper recognized the suspect as a person of interest from a recent burglary investigation. Kimball fled the scene on foot and discarded his backpack once law enforcement responded to the area. Officers located and searched Kimball's backpack. The suspect was later caught and taken into custody. Kimball is connected to several smash-and-grab burglaries, including the recent burglary string in the Railroad Square District. The Children's Homes Society of Florida is holding a teddy bear drive through the end of June. The organization says all stuffed animals donated to the drive will go to children who have suffered abuse. CHS's child protection team will distribute the toys to kids throughout the Big Bend. It hopes to gather more than 500 stuffed animals by the end of the month. You can drop off stuffed animals at the CHS office located at 1801 Mikusuki Commons Drive. This is Rachel N.A. with your World Talk 93.3 local news update brought to you by Macklemore Systems. Tallahassee's go-to Mac store. Check them out online at macklemoresystems.com. This is meteorologist Paul Trombley with your Real Talk 93.3 weather update. A heat advisory continues until 9 p.m. tonight. Chance for scattered storms this afternoon. Otherwise, mainly clear skies and quiet. Highs that allow around 101. Westerly winds, 8 to 15 miles per hour. 76 tonight. Chance for scattered thunderstorms. Scattered thunderstorms again tomorrow. High of 90. This report is brought to you by the Lawn Johns. For all your landscaping and lawn care needs, visit thelawnjohns.com. Right now, 100. Hey, no fans. Our partner, ISF Inc., is a national management and IT consulting firm located right here in Tallahassee, Florida, solving the future for state governments through strategy, process, and technology. As a trusted advisor for state governments, ISF knows the importance of defining a clear and detailed strategy. Our friends at ISF can help your organization create a strategy that sets you on a path to success. ISF. Your vision plus our expertise brings your brilliant ideas to life. Visit ISF.com to learn more. ISF, solving the future. Well, well, well. Hey, Jeff, look at this place. Yeah, yeah, well, doing well. It's been a while since I've seen you, brother. But, uh, you know, it hasn't been a while since I've been over to Gordo's. I go there on the regular because of you, Eddie. Well, we keep you regular. Well, that's true. But I think of Gordo's as a place to sit down, have a cold beer, Talk to your friends, enjoy the sports, eat the delicious food. But I think of you as Uncle Eddie, a man who takes care of his people and takes care of the town. I appreciate that, Jeff. Hey, and we'll keep you regular. Gordo's, bringing the flavor and flair of Cuban food to Tallahassee since 1996. Here's what you missed on the Greg Tish Show. We need to have history. We need to have literature. It deserves an explanation. We don't need to be promoting lifestyles that come into play for your average elementary school. Well, I had an experience with this. When my daughter was in school, her teacher gave her a book to read, but then she asked me what the C word is. That was in the book? That was in the book. Okay, so talking about the C word. So you're talking about conservatives, right? <laughs> <laughs> the Greg Tish Show, Monday through Friday, 6 to 9 a.m., only on Real Talk 93.3. The Jeff Cameron Show is sponsored by the legendary team at Hamilton Home Loan. Jeff. 
Jeff Cameron Show, Libations Friday rolling on. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you uh, fighting through it with me as, uh, again, the energy, the lack thereof isn't an indicator of my mood, but rather just the uh, the weakness that I feel. But, hey, man, I'm excited. I'm excited about uh, where we sit right now. Obviously, today's a good day. It should be a big weekend for Florida State football, too. A lot of people come into town. Uh, Knowles uh, get the bad news that we talked about. I want to bring up a bigger picture here. First, I'll mention specifically uh, Randy Pittman, uh, who, by the way, his nickname is Grenade. Grenade's a good nickname. Anyhow, he uh, has decommitted from Florida State. He was a three-star tight end. Uh, I'm not as as concerned as some appear to be in the chat. 6'2", 225-pounder. Uh, that means that Florida State, uh, with his departure, is down to seven current commits for the 2023 class. And and I think I think most in the fan base is uh, rightfully uh, fretting a little bit. You know, uh, this is not a program that has real momentum in recruiting. And I think that's the easiest way to say it. They don't have hardly any momentum in recruiting right now for that class. And people look at that and they say, well, Recruiting's the lifeblood of all successful programs. You don't have a lot of stars uh, waiting or banging down the door to come in. What guys you do have, you feel like maybe it's tenuous. Look, guys, none of this is going to change until they win some damn games. This is where we're at. Now, they cobbled together a top 20 class this last time. Um, They were able to kind of manipulate, if you will, uh, they lost on some guys there too that I was angry about. Obviously, we all know about Travis Hunter, but they, they lost some others that were uh, of key importance. But they still managed between the guys they did get, and then I think by the time we took a look at those that transferred in, you'd say that Florida State put their best foot forward given what the program's been, given where uh, we stand in the pecking order of things right now in big-time college football. That was a decent to good recruiting class. Not elite, not elite, just good. I think we would say good. You're not going to find this program on the top of the recruiting board anytime soon unless they win games. And I won't be surprised to see zero momentum as we head into the season from a recruiting standpoint. What has to happen, and we keep saying this, those first four to five games are of vital importance. We know how everything is sped up now. We know how important it is that you start off on the right foot and gain that momentum early when kids are having to make this decision as that time rapidly approaches. And so not only is it common sense that we talk about more wins equal more buzz in recruiting, but, you know, Tom, till we're blue in the face, we've had to have the conversation about, yeah, not Duquesne, but LSU and Louisville and Boston College and, it, and all these games that early on, if you can find a way to be three and one through four games or for five games be four and one, you got a real chance to change your fortunes in the world of recruiting. Yeah, the question that uh, this is a good test experiment or um, that, that's redundant, but it's a good experiment to see how important September really is with the early signing period. Because our speculation is if you play well in September and your win-loss record reflects that for the first time since you know 2015, then can you really convince some of these kids that are visiting right now to put you higher up in the pecking order slash can you get them back on campus before December 15th or whatever the day is going to be in December for National Signing Day? That's what we're all looking towards right now. And the hope is that you can do enough in September. Like, let's just say for argument's sake that they win the, the games that they're supposed to win. They, they win three out of the four or whatever it is in the month of September. So they're four and one when the page turns to October. If they can do that, and let's say for argument's sake that they do, does that actually mean that there's enough time left in the recruiting calendar to get some of these high level kids, these blue chippers to say yes to Florida State? That's the question I have, because I don't even know if that's possible. I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. It's just it seems so damn close to the time that you got to put pen to paper. That month of September, when we talk about the August 27th game against Duquesne, but the, the month of September is LSU, bye week, Louisville, Boston College. Those are the games you play in September. So, you know, I think it's fair to say you got to win two of those. Uh, and I, I'm assuming a win against Duquesne in August. But the, 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 the three games you play in September are LSU, on the road at Louisville, and home to Boston College. If you want to throw in the October the 1st tilt against Wake, I understand. 
uh, that game is at Doak as well. I mean, I think three and one, and you can start to see a shift somewhere in there. I think you start to see a shift. Yeah, I agree. I think what's interesting here, and we've gone back and forth in this debate, is which game is more important to recruits? Not necessarily to the program, but which game is more important to recruits? Would it be LSU on a Sunday night, or would it be Louisville on a Friday night? Because when you put it that way, what's more important to the 17-year-old, you could argue that the game in, in New Orleans is actually the more important game for establishing credibility as a program, especially because also it's on that first weekend of college football, which is kind of like a holiday weekend where I'm sure a lot of recruits are paying attention to a lot of these matchups because you've got a, a lot of good cross-pollination across the Power Five conferences playing each other. Well, it's a more high-profile win without question to beat LSU. LSU has... Uh, far more clout than Louisville does nationally. And 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 I would think any kind of a win. I, I get that we know, you and I know, that LSU wasn't any good last year and that they're going through a transformation as well with Brian Kelly taking over. But most high school kids, they're looking at names. They're looking at the cachet a program has. And LSU has a lot more than Louisville. So, yeah, I would, to me, with, with the whole nation watching that game uh, in isolation the way that it is, when you see, when you see the emblems, when you see – LSU's font and you see Florida State's spear and you look at those two clashing and you say, yeah, th this is this this still feels like in many ways because of the history, a big time clash. Whereas Florida State Louisville will never be that. It, it will always be, in this case, just a, an ACC game. Yeah, another argument I'd make for the LSU win being bigger, if you could get it, is that you've got a bye week right behind it. So you can go hit the road and recruit, which is what they're going to do. They're going to hit high schools as much as they possibly can the Friday nights that week and, and try to get kids in or, or do whatever it is. But they're not going to sit idly by in Tallahassee and just prepare for Louisville solely. They're going to get out there. And if you could do that at 2-0 and with a win over LSU, I think that time on the calendar provides a, a better resume builder, a, a better icebreaker to go into those high schools, to talk to those coaches or those middle people and make sure that the player understands Things are turning around. Now, you've got to validate it. You can't lay an egg on a Friday night against Louisville, but it's just the momentum that that would create going into a bye week, which is huge and so vital to the coaching staffs to go out there and hit the road. Maybe that is the more important game. I guess I'm talking myself into believing, even though for ACC hierarchy's sake, sure. the Louisville game is higher. Pro I think for recruiting's sake, the LSU game might be more important. Yeah, I, I, all of them are important. This is a huge year. Uh, you, you, we get where this program is at. It's not surprising. I guess my point would be people are like, wait a minute, we're hemorrhaging. We're not gaining momentum in recruiting. How is this going to get turned around? Hey, guys, we're at the crossroads. This is nothing that Norvell is pitching right now is in all likelihood going to make much of a difference. Games are. Games are going to make the difference now. I think he's done what he could with what he could um, and, and managed to put together, again, last year, despite the disappointments, a pretty good class. You don't really get any more, um, I think, residual effects from the messaging and the new car smell that is completely worn off and all. You don't really get any more of that until you win games. Uh, the, 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 the renewed enthusiasm to be a part of a bigger class that changes Florida State's fortunes moving forward is only going to happen on the heels of a lot of wins. So he's got to win games, and if he does, all of a sudden some names that you don't anticipate uh, looking at Florida State will start to uh, because I think he's a passionate coach that does connect with players, and he's been a little bit better recruiter than I expected him to be, at least in terms of those relationships, but – uh, you know, you got to win games to to change the hearts and minds of the of the better caliber players who have better options. Chef Cameron Show 93.3 Real Talk Radio and War Chant TV. Well, well, well. Hey, Jeff, look at this place. Yeah, My yeah. Well, doing well. It's been a while since I've seen you, brother. But, uh, you know, it hasn't been a while since I've been over to Gordo's. I go there on the regular because of you, Eddie. Well, we keep you regular. Well, that's true. But I think of Gordo's as a place to sit down, have a cold beer, Talk to your friends, enjoy the sports, eat the delicious food. But I think of you as Uncle Eddie, a man who takes care of his people and takes care of the town. I appreciate that, Jeff. Hey, and we'll keep you regular. Gordo's, bringing the flavor and flair of Cuban food to Tallahassee since 1996. Refreshing and simple. Two words you don't hear many people use to describe their experience going through the process of getting a home loan. That's what puts the Hamilton Home Loans experience in a category all their own. 
If you're buying or refinancing a home, Hamilton Home Loans will provide a personalized mortgage experience that is dedicated to making the process refreshingly simple. It all begins with an initial consultation with an experienced Hamilton Home Loans advisor to find out what your goals are in order to find the right mortgage to suit your specific needs. Then your personal home loan advisor will take you through all the steps from application, underwriting, approval, and closing, all the way to the front steps of your new home. Once you've experienced the Hamilton home loan process, you can be a customer for life and never have to pay lender fees again. For first responders, nurses, physician assistants, teachers, active and retired military, ask about the Hamilton for Heroes program. Personalized attention with your needs put first. Now that's refreshingly simple. Find out more at HamiltonHomeLoans.com. That's HamiltonHomeLoans.com. Equal housing lender. NMLS number 200719. You were always more than my mom. You were my role model my best friend and biggest supporter. You filled my days with unconditional love and you also prepared for the day when you couldn't be here. Because of the woman you were back then, I'm able to be the woman I am now. Your planning made this moment possible. Set your family up for life. Southern Farm Bureau Life Insurance. Your friends for life. This is Andy Cohen. When I was a law enforcement officer, I devoted my life to a career of service and protection. Who's protecting you? Give me a call. 850-671-FARM. That's 671-FARM. Helping you is what we do best. Southern Farm Bureau Life Insurance Company, Jackson, Mississippi. Not licensed to do business in all 50 states. There's fun to be had every night at the Corner Pocket. Take home prizes on Trivia Tuesdays and Beer Bingo Thursdays. And kickstart your weekend with Martini Fridays. Plus, happy hour runs every weekday and game day specials every time the Knolls take the field. Watch all the best games at the Corner Pocket's Vegas Wall. Featuring 560 inches of flat screen TV heaven. Oh, really? The best food, the best drinks, and the best place to watch all the games. Tallahassee loves the Corner Pocket. The Jeff Cameron Show is a production of the Warchant.com Multimedia Network. The end of an all-time great run may be at hand tonight. I'll ask you, Tom. Hockey end tonight. Forgive me, sir. A little bit of directing and uh, also uh, producing on the fly. Uh, I think um, probably so. Probably so. I think they're yeah, just. I think we're out of gas, but not heart. I'll say that. No, they they keep fighting like it. You know. I saw a commenter yesterday said, why aren't you commenting on the pathetic effort? And it's like, well, hang on a minute. They're down to five defensemen for more than a period and plus overtime in that game. Uh, Tony C., Anthony Sorelli has a a fundamental issue with his arm where he can't take face-offs. Not to mention that two or three of their stars already are really hurt, like Kucherov is hurt playing with a knee injury that he suffered in game three. Braden Point's not on the ice. Yeah, you might not know these names in the Tallahassee market, but suffice to say, I've listed a lot of different names. And you only get 18 of them in a hockey game to skate for you. So that's a problem when you're down four or five key players. If they find a way, I mean, it's just, it might bring a tear to my eye. This might be one of my favorite wins of the run. I just, I can't see them winning three straight. I hope they air it out tonight, but I just don't know what they can air it out with. Yeah, no, they they don't have much left uh, in in the tank. And, and again, you've alluded to the injuries and the lack of depth. For the, the other part for a lot of people, let's say you're just kind of getting into hockey, Tampa's played more hockey than any other club uh, in the entirety of the NHL, and by a lot. Um, and that's what happens when you're the most dominant franchise in the sport and you're the last one standing at the end of every year. Uh, so because the Lightning kept winning and going forward and winning and winning and winning and winning again and continuing to win and then winning again and winning again, that when that happens, eventually you've done so much winning uh, that A, you're hated, and B, you've played more than everybody else. And so I do think they resemble a team that's played a ton of hockey. Right, and the problem with the Olympic schedule this year is that the final 60 days of the season, you're playing like 32 or 33 games, and that's before the playoffs. 
and you play every other night for two more months in the playoffs. You add that uh, to the previous years. I'm not trying to make excuses because you know me. I'm the guy for years that said there was a culture of complacency right. in Tampa. There was a real culture of complacency. They get up 3-2 in a series and lay an egg. They look disinterested. That's not the same thing as what we're seeing now. They are doing everything they can, putting life and limb in the way of the puck to stop it so it doesn't get to the goaltender uh, in every shift. And I get it. That whole overtime, 95% of it was Colorado and the ice tilted in Tampa zone. They've got no legs. They've got no legs left. And it's hard to go to altitude with less than zero legs and perform against a well-oiled machine like Colorado. So if they do it, that's wonderful. But I'm not disappointed by the effort I saw the other night. I'm I'm actually buoyed by it. They've got the heart of a champion, and, and they've acquitted themselves unbelievably well in this run for the three-peat. And if they come all the way back, then it's... Oh, I mean, if they come all the way back, we're going to have wow. a different conversation. We may be weeping in each other's arms if they come all the way back. I don't even <laughs> want to talk about that. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they're going to come all the way back. But, hey, it's entirely possible. They do fight. They do fight. Hey, we got enough time here. I'm going to read to you from David Purdom's story, ESPN, this morning. It made me crack up laughing. And it is Libations Friday after all. we got a few minutes. Super Bowl Sunday, Las Vegas. Drinks are flowing at a private party for VIPs inside a Japanese restaurant at the Bellagio. High rollers are betting shots or taking shots of fireball on whether the next play in the Super Bowl between Kansas City and Tampa Bay would be a run or a pass. Things got sloppy. In the middle of all, Tanner Flynn, a tech salesman from Nashville, was sledding the last leg of an $8 parlay placed seven months earlier. The bet would pay over $20,000 on an $8 bet. The first four legs of the parlay are a hit. Usman had beaten Masvidal at UFC. The Lakers had won the 2020 NBA championship at plus 260. The Dodgers had won the 2020 World Series at plus 380. The Lightning had won the 2020 Stanley Cup at plus 600. The Bucks, who were 15 to 1 to win the Super Bowl when Flynn placed the bet with FanDuel, July 7th, 2020, jump out to a 21 to 6 lead. Flynn was half one half away. From correctly predicting the champions of all four major U.S. professional sports. At halftime, he posted a picture of his parlay on Twitter, adding one more blanking half. The tweet went viral. That night is a bit of a blur, Flynn told ESPN. I was extremely intoxicated. I couldn't figure out how to turn off my Twitter notifications at the time. So the whole night, everything just kept buzzing and buzzing and buzzing. The Bucks go on to win 31 to 9. That parlay paid out approximately 2,600 to 1. Fast forward 16 months to this week, and remarkably, Flynn is in position to do it again, Tom. If the Avalanche finish off the Lightning to win the Stanley Cup, For the second straight year, he will have correctly predicted the champion of the NFL, the NBA, and the NHL in a parlay bet with huge odds. He said, I guess I'm just a little bit lucky and a little bit crazy. The Avs is who he picked to win the Stanley Cup. He already had, obviously, Golden State. That's rather remarkable, I might add. Uh, This is... Pretty cool to see, but back-to-back is unheard of, and he's about to be a millionaire if it happens, and I think he's in good shape. Wow, that's incredible. You know, for years in the NBA, it would be predetermined. It's one of two teams. Golden State, obviously, is a a dynasty of its own, but they weren't thought to be the the odds-on favorite early on this year. Clay coming back was a good thing for them, but it wasn't like this was going to be the KD and Steph Curry Golden State Warriors. It's not going to be like that. To do that twice, I mean, Colorado's a good pick. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dog that. Uh, but that is just I mean, and what what's his wager though? If it's twenty six hundred to one for the first bet, how much is he, th- is he throwing down? It's gotta be a huge amount. Uh I gotta I can read further in the story. If he's I, in a lounge I, in Vegas, he's doing well. I mean, he's throwing a lot of money into it, would be my point. Yeah, he's done quite well for himself. Um I, I've been impressed uh to see the amount of people, and we're gonna start doing this privately on our own. Let's get together at the start of each year, each betting calendar, Tom, and see if we can't predict the winners of the major sports. Because I don't know, you probably would have taken the lightning at the start of this, maybe just out of, uh, well, A, they're an elite team, but B, there is some sentimentality there. I don't know. Would you have taken, who would you have taken if you didn't take the lightning? I would have been Colorado if I didn't take Tampa. 100% 100% just because I, I thought our legs were shot and we lost our third line. So that would have been tough. That would have been tough. Yeah, that's, that's fair. Um, I am kind of, I don't think any, either one of us would have taken golden state. In fact, I'm sure we wouldn't have. No, you there's might no have, you might've been willing to take Boston 
You might have been willing to take Milwaukee I, to back it up. I don't think we would have taken Golden State. I'll say that. So it's kind of fun. Yeah, to me, I wouldn't have taken um, – what unless the Rams were getting good value, I wouldn't have picked them either. I mean, Well, we identified the Rams as a pretty good pick, though. When they made the moves, they decided to put the chips on the table. We, we, we thought they had a good shot. You may not have taken them, but I, one of us in our group would have taken the Rams. They were a, we felt like they were a quarterback away. Yeah, for the value, yes, probably. Like Indianapolis this year. That would be a good pick because you're getting great value. Yeah, it's fun. This is good. We'll do this at the start of this. Now that we know that there's a guy out there steady winning it on his own on a regular basis, hour number two forthcoming. Stay with. More of the Jeff Cameron Show, live and local on Real Talk 93.3, WVFT, Greta Tallahassee. and Japan. And in Turkmenistan, it was 114. Texas A&M climate scientist Andrew Dessler says this is miserable. Some people can't afford air conditioning, and even if you can, he says you're stuck inside. And he reminds us of those who have to work outdoors in the sweltering heat. I'm Rita Foley. The Dow is up 644 points. The Nasdaq ahead 261. More at townhall.com. First, we decide where we want to go. Then we need to know the best way to get there. Hi, my name is Adam Barada. I'm the owner of Advantage Gold. We're the highest rated precious metals firm in the country. We teach people how to own physical gold and silver. Now, we've won the Best of Trust Link Award four years in a row because we educate our clients on how to buy gold and silver the right way. We don't pay celebrity spokespeople millions of dollars. We'd rather pass that value on to you. Call 800-900-8000 and speak with one of our experts. We'll send you a free gold kit along with my latest number one national best-selling book, The Great Devaluation. Call 800-900-8000. That's 800-900-8000. Get the best information, the best process, the best service, the best value. Call Advantage Gold at 800-900-8000. Call 800-900-8000. Let me tell you what T-Spark stands for. It stands for strength, commitment, teamwork, and heart. We don't ever quit until we've got nothing left to give. Our team is unstoppable. Want a guaranteed win? Call T-Spark Enterprises for your next roofing or construction project. We conquer all geeks. T-SparkConstruction.com. License number CCC 133 
We all want more energy, more strength, more results. Well, welcome to Orange Theory Fitness as you take a step towards feeling more alive today. Backed by science, Orange Theory's heart rate monitored workout is scientifically designed to keep heart rates in a target zone, spiking metabolism and increasing energy. Orange Theory Fitness is a one-of-a-kind group personal training workout resulting in more energy, visible toning, and extra calorie burn for up to 36 hours. Experience more vibrant life today with Orange Theory Fitness. To find out more, go to orangetheoryfitness.com. Broadcasting live from Florida's capital city, this is the Jeff Cameron Show, brought to you by Orange Theory Fitness on Real Talk 93.3. Now, stop what you're doing and listen closely. It's time for the Jeff Cameron Show in 5, 4, 3, 2. Hour number two, Libations, Friday edition of the Jeff Cameron Show. Pretty loosey-goosey. Maybe not as loosey-goosey as it normally would be. Bear with me. Sorry if I don't sound great or if the energy is lacking dealing with COVID. But uh, should be all right here in the next couple of days. And certainly, we're not missing any time. We couldn't possibly miss today on a day in which Florida State announces a new baseball coach. And it is indeed Link Jarrett. That will carry the momentum into the weekend, right? We're all excited about that. Florida State, I think, gets it right. They get a guy that uh, a lot of teams around the country wanted, a guy that uh, obviously would be very interested in coming home. Seems like a no-brainer. Florida State it made it efficient and easy, played out the right way. And so, Link Jarrett, we welcome you as uh, the new baseball coach at Florida State. And it'll be interesting to see what his staff looks like. I talked about it in a video we did on WarChant TV earlier this morning with Ira and Corey and Tom Produce and myself. Um, you know, that he, he's got a little bit of work to do initially. Obviously, he'll meet with his players uh, and find out which guys are uh, all in and, and locked in and excited to, to, to play for him and those that were considering uh, maybe looking elsewhere. I, I don't think it's a hard sell. I think that most people who follow college baseball, certainly if you play college baseball, you're aware of who's who. Um, you know, at, at this point, you, you know that that's a guy that, has had a lot of success in the game, played the game at a high level right here in Tallahassee, right here at Florida State, was an All-American, and is a guy that um, obviously loves the Knowles and has had success coaching outside the program. So I, I don't think he's going to have to win over too many people, but that'll be the first thing that he does. And then obviously he's got to get that staff together and figure out where we go from here on the recruiting trail. It's a big weekend for Florida State. Speaking of uh, recruiting, I should make mention that you can read all of those stories on warchant.com, including the story about Link Jarrett. Uh, Corey Clark wrote one. I know Ira uh, wrote, had the release when Florida State officially announced it. By the way, Monday, 10.30 a.m. is when the press conference will happen for Link Jarrett. What a great day that's got to be for him, man. What, what a cool uh, thing for him. And of course, a lot of us are looking at this as a win for Mike Alford, a win for the new athletic director. Um, it, it's hard not to look at it that way. Ultimately, Mike Alford, despite these early successes uh, in the eyes of most, is a guy that will be judged by football. And so while this is uh, a good sign moving forward, uh, I do think that, you know, at the end of the day, the bigger uh, the bigger issue and the bigger moment for his tenure here will be with football. And let's just knock on wood that it's uh, us talking about the extension that he's giving Mike Norvell after a nine win campaign, Tom, uh, the, the weekend I alluded to here in Tallahassee is recruiting. We, what, what do you got? Eight guys, I think coming into town that are important. Uh, yeah, you got a bunch of guys, including perhaps quarterback Chris Parson, which would be interesting if he makes it here, given that that's been a rocky relationship of late. Yeah, so, <laughs> Uh, and listen, I'm not up to the minute on that stuff. That's where you got to make sure you follow at warchant.com. You go to the premium recruiting board and make sure you keep up to date with what Michael Langston's reporting. Austin Cox is working on as well. They'll keep you up to date there. I do have a bit of news, though, because uh, the letter of understanding that Link Jarrett had signed is now in our inboxes. Uh, and we have the first couple of years worth of compensation for Link Jarrett, which uh, I was wondering what that number would be. And it's a seven year deal. I reported that this morning. Uh, but $875,000 is the number for the first couple of years. It goes up as time goes on. 
it looks like Florida State had to cut a check of just over $100,000 to Notre Dame uh, for the buyout. whoop de doo That's no big deal at all. Uh, but Link Jarrett, seven years, and it starts at 875 k and climbs up as, as time goes on. Tells you a couple things. So, obviously, they're basically doubling what they were paying Mike Jr. Um, pretty close to doubling that. I think the other thing it tells you is, again, Notre Dame is not committed uh, to to paying a baseball coach a million dollars plus. Uh, that, that's not a program that has met with a huge amount of success. Um, I, I tried to, without belittling people, when we had this discussion in the past, uh, I and I perhaps belittled some, Tom. I see the smirk on your face. But without belittling people, I was, I was trying to explain that um, the football mentality that our fan base seems to, or a percentage of our fan base, seems to apply to all things that have nothing to do with football uh, would not matter here. Um, that, that the fact that um, college baseball coaches don't make anything close to college football coaches – Universities, many universities, including Notre Dame, don't view baseball uh, as a particularly important sport or a revenue-producing sport. So this was not going to be an arms race for a program of Notre Dame stature and what they have in the coffers, and then a program of Florida State's program uh, stature and what they have in the coffers. Florida State is an infinitely superior baseball program to Notre Dame. It's not even; they're not even. They don't live on the same street. They're not even in the conversation. Notre Dame isn't when it comes to baseball compared to Florida State. And then you throw in the mix that the man played here, is from here, wanted to come back here. And then you throw into the mix that Florida State was going to put together an offer that puts him amongst the higher paid coaches in the sport. $875,000, or is that what you just said, I think? Yes, um, that puts him in great standing amongst the world of college baseball coaches. It's just not a sport that pays millions of dollars per year for its coaches, unless you have a university that has more money than cents, like Texas A&M and a few others that might be willing to w grossly overpay their college baseball coach. Well, a couple of things. Number one, it's like any negotiation with any free agent in major sports and professional sports. If you're talking about athletes, you can lower the annual value if you increase the term. So I think, you know, going seven years allows you not have to part with an extra three or four hundred thousand dollars up front per season. And the other thing that that frees uh, Florida State up to do is now the in this letter of understanding, it says that a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar pool will be put together for two full time assistants and a support staff hire as well. So they got four hundred and fifty K what they were paying me just to hire assistant coaches. That's good. I'm sure that that's a bump up from where it was before, in addition to the fact that they're doubling his salary. So. It all seems good, and if you hear some of the whispers around and you listen to them and you give them weight, it sounds like some of the people that are involved money-wise with the baseball program have committed to investing and helping Hauser get better. You know, okay, so knows it yet, but that's an important thing too that you have the blessing of the people because it was divided among the money people, just like it was divided among the fan base. What the right course of action was for Florida State's baseball head coaching job. Okay, so what I was, uh, well, what I would. What I would add to that piece of information, Tom, is that most people understand, and, and if you're not in a baseball culture, it, good for you, because you don't want to be. It's a terrible place to live. Um, baseball culture is awful. Uh, if you've ever been amongst travel team parents, you know how awful it is. Um, there's nothing worse than travel ball, and there's nothing worse than the parents at travel ball. And the whole thing, anyhow, I bring all of this up because everybody grew up playing baseball of a certain age. So everybody thinks they know uh, what should happen with every baseball coach, every baseball team, how it should work. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry has got an opinion about baseball because they played it. Because they played it. Not everybody can play football. Not everybody can play basketball. Not everybody, but everybody grew up playing baseball. So they all think they know a ton about baseball. And it's quite maddening. Now, that said, it's also very political. Baseball is very political, and you get into these high school arguments, and it goes all the way through into college. It is fascinating. The coach is playing this guy because he's best friends with that kid's dad. My son is an infinitely superior shortstop. If that son of a bitch doesn't do the right thing, I'm going to transfer and expose him. And these are the kinds of things that go on all the time in the world of baseball, and that continues to work right up to the money. 
right up to the money. Who's given? Who's going to pull money if this guy's not hired or this guy's not brought in? Who's willing to stay the course and pay this guy more? And all of that was going on back when Mike Martin Jr. got hired after 11 was deciding to retire. This became a political struggle that, of course, always is going to involve money. And at the end of the day, I'm not going to get into the nuts and bolts of all of that, but you have a couple of very important people when it comes to baseball who have largely for many years, now they've backed off some over the years, controlled the financial purses, Tom, the purse strings, all right? This is kind of what they've done for a long time. Uh, I'll put money here. I'll put money there. This is the guy I'd like to see get the job. Those kinds of people, right? So the point would be one of the things that had to happen when the transition was desired by the new athletic director was that some of those people who have been involved in baseball for a long time and, again, are considered quote-unquote money people had to sign off on it. And I think that you see a signifier here that there's a willingness to go a different direction. Now, it made it easier that you were going to be bringing home one of our own. I think that certainly made it easier for people who have been long-term invested in baseball. But I also think that those people, by saying I'm willing to – to go there with you and to and to embrace this transition, it was their way of saying, go ahead and do what we think you have to do. Unfortunately, this didn't work out. And oh, by the way, you have my support. And by, oh, by the way, you have my support, they mean I'll help you financially to do what needs to be done. And so a lot of questions got answered with the hiring of Link Jarrett. Not just that your athletic director was willing to identify a problem and do something about it, but that the, the whole transitional team from athletic director on down was in favor of the steps that need to be taken. And of course, those are always also going to involve money. So I suggest to you now that in the next couple of years, you're going to start to see some changes regarding Florida State's Dick Hauser Stadium, Mike Martin Field. What those look like, I do not know. To what degree, I do not know. It could very well be that they seek to build a brand new stadium. Who knows? But I do think you're going to see this, this bigger vision, this larger transition of which I speak take place. Yeah, the question is, if you have, let's just say, a million widgets to use, right? A million pesos. Where, where are you going to spend the money? Where are you going to put it into? And, and would it be... The infrastructure for the clubhouse and the players, so it's more attractive to the players, or is it going to be cosmetic because you want ticket sales? Or is it, you know, for every dollar you spend on, you know, making the offices better for the coaches or the setup uh, better for the players, you got to spend an equal part to help the stadium look a little bit better. Is Dick Hauser Stadium salvageable? Now, I know you would say no, uh, cool. or would require a hell of a lot of money. You might as well build a new one at that point. That might be the way that they see it. But you're going to get an idea here. If they are putting lipstick on a pig with some of these repairs or updates that are- They've to got the new padding. Right. Well, if they've got more of that, like the seating area, maybe they expand it a little bit. If it's not a major overhaul of a project, then I would think the long-term vision is that they're going to build a new stadium. Like If it, if it looks like a short-term fix, kind of a uh, 500 grand was thrown into Dick Hauser to do this or that, the concourse is going to look nicer. If it is overhaul down one of the baselines, like they're putting in seating that's going to connect all the way to the foul pole and there's going to be a luxury you know, bar area or something like that, that tells me that Hauser will remain. And this is going to be the plot of land it's on come hell or high water. But it'll be fascinating to hear just as a citizen of this town. I know it doesn't matter to a lot of the Knoll fans out there that are regional, but as a citizen of Tallahassee, I want Hauser to be a place to be. I want more amenities there. So hopefully we get some announcements to that end here soon. Yeah, I'm excited about that, too. It, it's always fun to watch this stuff play out. I've been here for a lot of the changes, and I know these are always indications of how old I'm getting. I can remember when they expanded the stadium the last time, Tom, and um, I remember thinking that was a huge deal because I went to games long before that had happened. And, um, you know, I, I, there was a time where that was the gym of college baseball for a short period of time, and, and it hasn't been in a long time. So just from a nostalgic standpoint, from a love school and for a program that deserves better, I hope that there are real thoughts moving forward on, on how to get the most out of uh, this baseball program. That certainly involves facility as well. I'll tell you what, at some point, we probably 
be be right to bring on Chip Baker to have this conversation uh, if he would do it. Now, Chip is 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 not in the business of ruffling feathers, but uh, he's the kind of guy, and he knows I am, so he would probably say no. He would probably say, I know what you're going to do. You're going to get me on under the auspices of being friendly, and then you're going to ask a very pointed question that puts me on the spot, and I'm going to look like a jerk, and I can't answer that, and you know that, and then you're going to go. <laughs> Chip, how much does Hauser suck? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know that I would ask him that kind of a loaded question, but I would maybe maybe ask the same thing phrased slightly differently. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and then he'd be like, great. Yeah, depend on the day. It, it would depend on your mood. Yeah, it would. Um, but anyhow, that's funny. I, <laughs> I, I love, uh, I love talking to Chip, and I've known him for many, many years, and I know he has opinions on uh, on Dick Hauser and what can be done. I just don't think he's ever going to share them <laughs> on this show. I'll put it that way. The Jeff Cameron Show, ninety three three Real Talk Radio and Warchan TV. When you need a plumber, quick. How long is an acceptable time to have to wait? Uh, yeah, hey, it's the Millers again. Uh, just calling you about our little plumbing problem. Two hours? Hey, uh, we were hoping you can get here soon because the water is getting really bad. I mean, it's... Please hurry. Four hours? Yeah, I know you said you were on your way, but, uh, honey, tell the kids to drink water. Eight hours? Don't worry about us. We're fine. At m and Plumbing, you'll never have to wait long for quality, dependable service right when you need it. At m and Plumbing, we listen to our customers and our qualified technicians aim to achieve 100% customer satisfaction. So the next time you need plumbing work or repairs, think of the name m and Plumbing, your local plumbing experts, commercial or residential. Give us a call, 850-575-9393 or visit us online at mnlplumbing.com. m and Plumbing, for all of your plumbing needs. Hi, this is Jamie McClenney from Trek Financial in Tallahassee. Managing downside risk in your portfolio is one of the biggest challenges that you'll face in retirement. Trillions of dollars in stimulus from the Federal Reserve and D.C. politicians combined with zero interest rates have propped up financial markets since the financial crisis ended in 2009. The Fed recently ended quantitative easing and has started to raise interest rates at a time when the global economy was already slowing. Have you considered what another 50% correction in the stock market would do to your retirement plan? If you're concerned about where this all might be headed and would like to find out about the potential benefits of an active risk management strategy for your portfolio, give me a call at 850-900-5200 and schedule a time for a review of your portfolio from an active risk management perspective. Make Jamie your first call for a second opinion. Investment advisory services are offered through Trek Financial, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. Clean, renewable energy means fresher air, healthier residents, new green jobs, and a stronger, more resilient community. How we get there is up to you. Share your input today to help shape the Tallahassee of tomorrow. Take the clean energy survey at talgov.com. Dirty exterior? Don't scrub it. Wet it and forget it. Wet and forget the easy outdoor cleaner. Wet and forget works over time with Mother Nature to eliminate unsightly black and green stains on the exterior of your home with no scrubbing, power washing, or bleach. Use wet and forget on all your outdoor surfaces, including decks, siding, roofs, and patios. Wet and forget's available in a concentrate or extreme reach hose in. Purchase wet and forget in store or online at Lowe's, Menards, Ace, or Walmart. Angie's List is now Angie, your home for everything home. With Angie, you could cross your next project off your to-do list before this ad is over. Just tell us what you need and we'll handle the rest. Sending a top pro to get it done. Or browse reviews, compare quotes from pros, and connect instantly. All for free. For everything from routine maintenance to a dream remodel. Because however you want your project done, we'll get it done. Download the app or go to Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com to get started. Wildfires and other disasters are becoming a way of life. For many, preparing go bags relieves stress. Tips for disaster preparedness and suggestions for putting together your own go bag are available from FEMA at ready.gov and you can search go bag on jw.org. 
We all want more energy, more strength, more results. Well, welcome to Orange Theory Fitness as you take a step towards feeling more alive today. Backed by science, Orange Theory's heart rate monitored workout is scientifically designed to keep heart rates in a target zone, spiking metabolism and increasing energy. Orange Theory Fitness is a one-of-a-kind group personal training workout resulting in more energy, visible toning, and extra calorie burn for up to 36 hours. Experience more vibrant life today with Orange Theory Fitness. Find out more, go to orangetheoryfitness.com. The Jeff Cameron Show, brought to you by Orange Theory Fitness. Two Tallahassee locations, Midtown on... I have a follow-up, Tom. You wanted to know the answer to uh, the story I was reading earlier, David Purnham's story, if you guys are interested in reading the whole thing on ESPN, uh, about this man who uh, had properly, uh, Tanner Flynn, uh, a tech salesman in Nashville, put together a a, a parlay for the ages in which uh, he bet Usman to beat Masvidal, took the Lakers back in 2020 to win the NBA Finals, the Dodgers the same, the Lightning the same at plus 600 in 2020. Now you fast forward to this season, and he's already on the verge of doing it again. He has the Avalanche, who, if they finish off the Lightning tonight, win the Stanley Cup, and he will, in turn, win the bet, go back to when he decided to do it. He was in his apartment in Nashville, and he put together Golden State, took the Rams, took the Georgia Bulldogs, who I also had, by the way, and he took the Avalanche. He uh, also decided to throw in a random UFC fight. He won that when Whitaker lost uh, to uh, Desanya, and that $25 bet will pay. By the way, Tom, here's your answer. It was plus 136,367 were the odds. Oh my God. I thought it was just the, the couple of major sports teams. So you're, it's all of these other wrinkles to it too. So no, wow. he, so yeah, he takes, he adds, he'll always add uh, a UFC fight. And then of course he took the national champions in college football. He took the Super Bowl winner, the uh, Stanley cup winner and the NBA finals winner. And so, yeah, that's, that's his bet. That's where he's going with it. At plus yeah. 136,000, 25 mm-hmm. bones. Oh mm-hmm. my goodness! Um, can you imagine, like, ah, to be can sitting you, there tonight? Can you imagine the heartbreak? In, you know, when when the lightning come back from three one down, <laughs> and somehow Vassy makes fifty five saves. Well, the team. here's what I will tell you: At what point do you hedge and lock in that profit, baby? Because if the lightning win tonight, you're going to hedge if you're him. Yeah, and you would get a, a really good payday, I would think. I mean, you're looking at, at rough math, but you're looking at, what, $3 million, something like that, close to $3 million in, in profit. So they would be offering you around 800000 to a mil? I, I don't know how it would work. I just would love to be in the position. I, I would like to find out what kinds of choices I have uh, as I lock in said profit. That's what I would like to do. That would, that would be a joy. Uh, I've never been in that position I've never had any luck typically with uh, parlays. I don't know. We'll see. You know, I want to segue here because I see you guys talking about it on the chat. And this is yet another reason why we need Mike Norvell to, uh, to get it right, okay? To, 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 to not put us in a position. No matter how good we feel about the direction of the athletic programs under Mike Alford, we don't want to have to start over. So I'll ask you this. Um, the question that they presented on the boards here or on the chat was, who is the football equivalent to baseball's Link Jarrett? Who is the guy, the no-brainer, that Florida State goes out and gets if Mike Norvell fails? And I've asked myself that question many times, and I don't have a good answer. And that tells you where we're at. A lot of times when you watch college football – you'll find three or four guys at any one time that you know are the huge names, the guys that you'd want to go get, right? Who's that guy? Who's that guy? Um, who Who's that guy that realistically you'd be able to go get? It's Mark Stoops, buddy. See? See what I'm saying? Who's that guy, Tom? 
who's the guy that's the no-brainer that you're going to go out and get if it doesn't work out with Norvell? And that you have a realistic shot. You can't like, oh, I'd go out and get Nick Saban. Yeah, no, you won't. Like, so you you got to name realistic candidates that feel like can't miss selections. And right now in the world of college football, there aren't too many guys that fit that bill. Yeah, I um, I'm only kind of quasi kidding too, with because I think that's the one that fits all of the parameters, which is like, who can you afford? <laughs> Where are you as a program? What's your overall situation and who can do more with less? He's the one that fits because he's done more with less at Kentucky. Now I understand the windfall of SEC money has you know, started to come in uh, by leaps and bounds since he took over at that program. But when he took over at Kentucky, nine win seasons or, or 10 win seasons were a complete pipe dream and nobody cared about that program relative to basketball. So I'm not trying to be the band leader here. I want Norvell to succeed, and, and this could be a moot point, but if you're trying to go through that exercise of like who is realistically out there, attainable, and can work in this situation and make it work, I don't know many other candidates other than the dude up at Kentucky. So you would say Luke Fickle um, is the answer, I think, whether he's done at Cincinnati, but his ties are all to Ohio State. And, you right. know, yeah, I mean, but but Day's not going anywhere. So maybe he gives up on the pipe dream of Ohio State? I don't know. Now, you said recently that they were recruiting really well, right? They were uh, in the next year's. Uh, Cincinnati is, seconds. yeah. Yeah. Cincinnati yeah. is, yeah. I'll go study that class and see how many kids are in the Southeast footprint. If he has a few, then then maybe I would change my story. Yeah, I think that's the hard part, right? There are guys. like So, for example, some people have asked about Utah, and you guys know how much money I've made off of Utah, who I also think is a candidate to make us more money this year in Utah. Kyle Whittingham is a coach at Utah, and he does a great job. Um, and I don't think he's leaving. He's got a, a real good situation. I don't think he's coming to, to the Southeast. I don't think he would you know, want to coach Florida State necessarily – um, and, and that is the other part of the equation. When we, when we think of these candidates, there are people that succeed in certain areas of the country uh, where they have ties, where they have connections to the high schools in the region, where they have um, a system, for lack of a better term, set up uh, where they can have success that don't necessarily portend of success elsewhere. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're a West coast guy, your whole life and you've lived out there, you grew up out there, you played football out there, you went to endless coaches camps out there and, and, and football camps when you were a player out there, then you have connections in those areas that, uh, have tentacles, right? They go on for days, but they're primarily on the West coast. And then you uproot all of that and you go to the East coast or you go to the South the guarantees. There are no guarantees that it's going to work out for you there. So it's tough. It's tough. Uh, I know a lot of our fan base, or at least anytime I look at the chat, I crack up laughing. Um, everybody wants Lane Kiffin. And of course, Lane Kiffin is a scumbag of the greatest proportion. Um, he's a very difficult guy for me to stomach to say out loud. Um, but I understand most people don't care about that. They would say, hey, bring in whoever you got to bring in. I mean, uh, I'll tell you, it, I, I would have a hard time with that, but you know. Well, who would you bring in first, Lane Kiffin or Deion Sanders? <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, it's a fair question. Both of them clearly know how to recruit in the modern era, and you know, uh, uh, I'm sure Deion uh, would have the full weight of uh, the financial backing behind him, this, the same way that Lane would. So, who would you yeah, rather have? I, I um, I'd like to to look elsewhere. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd like us to, to look elsewhere uh, on both fronts and um, we can go from there. Um, and I've brought up the reasons why for many, many times, for many years, I don't feel like having this fight yet again. Um, but it's, it's not, I don't mean you and me. Uh, I just, it's not, it's absurd, but, but I, I would, I, I'm talking about realistic coaches that you could bring in here uh, who've accomplished something in the sport uh, on, in that realm. And, and, and we don't have, uh, as much in the way of uh, weighty off the field issues to to kind of navigate. Well, that's why you have the answer right here. That's the thing. He's already in that office. You don't need to have him clean out his office. He just needs to get it together this season, and we're on the right path, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Boy, you don't believe that at all. I do believe that. I, I, I. It doesn't. I've said this a lot lately. Um. 
I believe there are a lot of good coaches who get fired. It happens all the time. I think there are a ton of good coaches who get fired. And, you know, Mike Norvell, I don't know where I stand on that. Um, I, I, I'm i worried for him. I'm worried for him. I believe he's a good coach. And I'm rooting for him to get it right because I don't want to start over. I'm tired of starting over. And no matter who we hire, okay, I don't care if it's Deion Sanders, if it's Lane Kiffin or who, whoever. I mean, I, that seems like a ridiculous conversation. But I, it, no matter who it is, um, you're starting over, and starting over is no good, man. You're gonna you're you're screwed for your first class in recruiting. You're just the whole thing. We've seen how these first year coaches, even with reputations, good ones, uh, struggle mightily. I, I'm gonna be very interested to watch. I'll tell you a, a good case study. Um, let's find out. What, let's see what Billy Napier does at Florida. I think he's a good football coach, but there's a guy that is coming from. Uh, Louisiana, obviously, and let's see how well he does. I think it's going to be important for him to get off to a good start. I do think he's a good football coach, but recruiting is everything. I agree with you there, and so I'm kind of curious to see these coaches, a lot of these guys with everything sped up the way that it is now, if you don't hit early or you don't have a successful season early for whatever reason, the, the ship could sail and you could never you could never bring it back to port. It could very well be you're never able to get a handle on it. Well, for the Napier situation, how huge is that game against Utah in, in week two where you're hosting? Well, it might be week one for them, but uh, you're hosting Utah, who's bringing back a lot of their players in the trenches. I know that because I was educated by somebody that's on this screen, not named myself, but they bring back a lot of the work in the trenches. They've got a good football coach and a, a, an established program. They know who they are, but they're playing in the humidity in September in Gainesville, Florida. So that's a distinct advantage. Plus, it's going to be a raucous atmosphere for a coaching debut. But you better win that game or show out okay, because if Utah stomps them to start the, the regime of Billy Napier, that might set them back for this recruiting class. Because as you said before, September is a dangerous month if you don't play very well in it. And you know, God forbid they lose to Utah and then they lose to Tennessee in the month of September. That thing might be dead before it even gets a chance to get off the ground. Let's hope, Tom. Let's hope that that's what happens. Let's hope that uh, Florida loses by 27 and questions begin almost immediately. Uh, it'd be it'd be wonderful. Uh, I will. I, I'm laughing, Ryan. I see your comment. Jeff would have started Will Greer after he did a line of coke on the coach's desk, but he won't jump on the lane train. Uh, I'd be more apt to go that direction than I would Dion. Yeah, I would be. Uh, but I I, that was I, the answer. R real quick, Florida's first four games. It's Utah. Yeah, they got host. Kentucky early too. Week two, they host Kentucky. Then they play USF, whatever. And then they go on the road to Rocky Top. So those those first four games are a bear for a brand new coach, given the way that the East is uh, shuffled right now. It shouldn't be traditionally speaking, but Kentucky and Tennessee, where they are relative to Florida, that's a, that's a tough stretch to start their season. Hey, give me, the, um, give me their first four games again in order. Utah, September yep. 3rd. Yep. Okay, Kentucky, it's a primetime kick, 7 o'clock on the 10th in Gainesville. Yeah, they're going to win that game. All right, South Florida, whatever, yeah. at home. Uh, and then they travel to Rocky Top, September 24th. So that'll be key. That's the huge one right there because uh, they're slight underdogs at home against Utah. That's a pick em game. I like Utah in that game with the experience that they have at quarterback and on that offensive line. I think they're also really physically tough. Should be a fun game. The Kentucky game, I know they lost a year ago. Weird set of circumstances there. Or is, do I have that right? They won that game a year ago, didn't they? Double check that. No, they lost that game. They lost the game. That was a weird game. We'll go with um, that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, <laughs> but then I think, uh, I, I, obviously, USF, they'll blow the doors off of USF. It's a nothing program. But then then you go uh, the Tennessee game, Rocky Top. Everybody thinks that they have real momentum in Tennessee. I'm not so sure I agree with that. Uh, let's find out what happens. Two and two for the Gators to start the year. That'd be nice. Yeah, and then uh, they got a bit of a break in the middle of the schedule. It's Eastern Washington, so that's their win October 1st. What a strange time to play that game. They host Mizzou. You should win that football game. But then it's LSU, Georgia, and Texas A&M in your next three. I mean, that's, that's, again, that's brutal. Yeah, could be could be a tough day at the office. What a what a shame. What a shame. Hate to see it, Tom. Hate to see it. Jeff Cameron, show 93.3 Real Talk Radio and War Chat TV.
local news now. A fourth suspect has been arrested in connection to a murder in Quincy from December. Tyreka Smith was the latest suspect to be arrested in the murder of 31-year-old Jermaine Rittman. Rittman was shot to death at a home in the 1600 block of Hardin Avenue on December 28th. Investigators have described it as a robbery gone wrong. The other men who have been arrested in this case include Roderick Gordon, Marco Rollins, and DeFarcus Showers. There is still a fifth suspect that is yet to be apprehended. New developments are set to bring tens of millions of dollars to the Tallahassee airport, and the project is also creating hundreds of jobs. A few companies plan to build new hangars at TLH, and those hangars will be used for airplane maintenance and repairs. Those companies plan to lease 57 acres of land for those hangars, along with new ramp space. The facilities will also be used for aircraft maintenance and breaking down old aircraft while recycling 85% of their material. Other infrastructure improvements include new drainage systems, water, sewers, and utilities. This is Rachel Linnae with your Real Talk 93.3 Local News Update, brought to you by Macklemore Systems. Tallahassee's go-to Mac store. Check them out online at macklemoresystems.com. This is meteorologist Paul Trombley with your Real Talk 93.3 weather update. A heat advisory continues until 9 p.m. tonight. Chance for scattered storms this afternoon. Otherwise, mainly clear skies and quiet. Highs level off around 101. Westerly winds, 8 to 15 miles per hour. 76 tonight. Chance for scattered thunderstorms. Scattered thunderstorms again tomorrow. High of 90. This report is brought to you by the Lawn Johns. For all your landscaping and lawn care needs, visit thelawnjohns.com. Right now, 102. Hey, no fans, our partner ISF Inc. is a national management and IT consulting firm located right here in Tallahassee, Florida, solving the future for state governments through strategy, process, and technology. As a trusted advisor for state governments, ISF knows the importance of defining a clear and detailed strategy. Our friends at ISF can help your organization create a strategy that sets you on a path to success. ISF, your vision plus our expertise brings your brilliant ideas to life. Visit ISF.com to learn more. ISF, solving the future. Well, well, well. Hey, Jeff, look at this place. Yeah, My yeah. Goodness. Well, doing well. It's been a while since I've seen you, brother. But, uh, you know, it hasn't been a while since I've been over to Gordo's. I go there on the regular because of you, Eddie. Well, we keep you regular. Well, that's true. But I think of Gordo's as a place to sit down, have a cold beer, talk to your friends, enjoy the sports, eat the delicious food. But I think of you as Uncle Eddie, a man who takes care of his people and takes care of the town. I appreciate that, Jeff. Hey, and we'll keep you regular. Gordo's, bringing the flavor and flair of Cuban food to Tallahassee since 1996. Here's what you missed on the Greg Tish Show. There's a TikTok that's going viral because of a butter softening method. They are putting the Vermont Creamery butter in the waistband of her pants. Give it five minutes, you can go and measure out your ingredients, and then your butter is ready to go. You um, cannot do this in Florida. No. Because your pants will be full of butter yeah. in two minutes. Somebody try it. Post on TikTok. Tag. Unless it says juicy across the back. <laughs> The Greg Tish Show, Monday through Friday, 6 to 9 a.m., only on Real Talk 93.3. The Jeff Cameron Show is sponsored by the legendary team at Hamilton Home Loans. Great rare. Live Nation's Friday rolling on. Jeff Cameron Show, 93.3 Real Talk Radio, War Chat TV. Good to be with you. Appreciate you. Ryan asked something during the break. Since it is Lucy Goosey, I'll address it. Uh, there is an aspect to this that we have not talked about, and I have thought about, especially now that you see, obviously, he's empowered. Now, again, there are a lot of other factors that will come into play. It's a football coach, not a baseball coach. But he noted that uh, he's interested, uh, since Norvell was not Mike Alfred's guy, if eight and four the next two seasons would be good enough. I think on the heels of the disastrous last five years, yes, it probably would be. Um, I think other circumstances, and this is an arc, uh, this is a, if you think about the arc of the arguments that we've had over the years, you may remember, Tom, I had one um, towards the end of the Jimbo uh, era with uh, Corey Clark on some of the headlines in which I said, if Florida State went 10 and three, two or three years in a row, uh, and we got further and further removed <clears throat> from, from the Jameis Winston era, and we consider what came before it and what was now happening after it, I argued that at some point, at that point, the program's clout was such that uh, people would begin to get restless, that some people would begin to say that he's underwhelming, underachieving, and has reached a place of stagnation. And Corey disagreed with me, and back and forth we went. And, of course, it all depends on, in the given moment, 
uh, what kind of clout, what kind of money, what kind of investment, what kind of previous successes uh, have led to this discussion, right? If Florida State is a perennial national power and is competing for a spot in the college football playoff every year and suddenly takes a turn south to lose three and four games three or four years in a row, then you very, very you're, you're, the, the reality is you're very likely, I should say, excuse me, to, to be inclined to want a guy to be removed. If you've had losing seasons for the last handful of years and somebody gets you to eight and four in consecutive seasons, you're not as quick to want to pull the trigger, I don't think. I don't even know that it enters your mindset. Yeah, I'd say, you know, eight and four, it, it's interesting. The first thing I did was I went to 2023 to see the future opponents. And of course, you're playing LSU again next year, and that game's going to be in Orlando. You play Florida. Your cross division, uh, your intra ACC, inter ACC opponent outside of Miami is Virginia Tech on the road. Now, typically that would make you blush, but I don't know if in 2023 that makes you blush. And then it's North Alabama and Southern Miss. So, in short, I'd say this feels like a little bit more of a gettable schedule in 2023 with where you should be as a program. So, eight and four shouldn't feel as good in 2023. If it was a year in which you had Notre Dame and Georgia or something like that, which is technically on the horizon if college football isn't imploding by then. Uh, then maybe eight and four in back-to-back years would certainly be a rousing success enough right, right. that Alford would retain Mike Norvell. But just looking at that schedule next year, we'll, we'll see how it lays out when the time comes. I don't know. Eight and four seems awfully doable. If it's if it's doable this year, then most certainly you need to go eight and four next year at minimum. Isn't it funny how we do this? I, I, I am just like you and um, like uh, all our listeners. It's not hard for me to skip the upcoming important season and look ahead at the one, two, and three years from now. I do it all the time. I'm forever. I'm like, well, yeah, we know this season's important. What are we going to look like the following year? It's ridiculous. We're always looking on the horizon. What is the landscape going to look like three years from now? And where's our place in it? You know, it's all going to be dictated by what you do this upcoming year. It will be, but this was part of the exercise. And we've broken down this schedule every which way that you possibly can. And so for me, part of the exercise was assume eight and four this year and then take a look at next year because I haven't really crunched the numbers on that schedule. And is it acceptable? And I'd say first blush. No, I don't think it would be. If you're eight and four this year, then you better damn sure go minimum eight and four next year. You can't go back to seven and five or six and six. That's not how this works. No, 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 no. He's saying back to back eight and four seasons. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nobody's suggesting that it would be okay to go eight and four and then six and six. No, no. At that point, man. Yeah, I don't. It's interesting. You, depending on the guy you run into at the bar, he doesn't think eight and four is okay. Uh, it's funny. People are stuck in the mindset of Florida State should play for or compete for a national championship every year. We aren't that program right now, guys, and that is the sad reality. Well, what if you finish nine and four this season? And that could it. It just means that you could be nine and three with a bowl loss or eight and four with a bowl win. I mean, I would think even that guy at the bar, if you threw nine at him, like we talk about all the time, sometimes the way you throw numbers, it just changes. If you say something's a month away, that hurts. If you say it's only 29 sleeps away, that feels a lot better than a month away. 29 sleeps away feels a whole lot better. If you say we're going to have nine wins this season and you omit that it might be a bowl game that gets you to nine, I think that dude at the bar might be more apt to say, okay, all right, nine wins, that, that's doable. Because it also allows us to watch our team play in December, which we haven't done in forever, and you get a chance to win a football game in December. So that'd be pretty cool. They got to stay healthy at the end of the day. I think they're good enough with their starting 22 to 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 win eight games. Maybe, maybe if they, the ball bounces right in all the 50-50 games and you win the turnover luck battle and you stay injury free. I mean, there's a lot of contingencies here, but if that were to happen, you could you could get to nine wins. And if that happens, obviously the ball should get rolling in recruiting and you start to feel much better about projecting better seasons in the years to come. There'd be real momentum in recruiting at that point. I don't think seven and five garners any momentum in recruiting. That's why I kind of exclude that. A lot of people say that the magic number is eight. Yeah, I, I think I think it does because I think um, if by chance you win eight games, it means you beat a couple of teams that a lot of people right now don't think that you you were going to beat. Yeah, though by definition, that's correct. And what's interesting, and, and maybe this is the right answer to the earlier question I posited, is how important can September really be? 
Like how, how important can the results of September be if you've got a signing period in, in December? Can you do enough? Well, maybe the answer is if you're at Rising Spear, and this isn't tongue-in-cheek, I, I legitimately mean this. If you're at Rising Spear, you are trying to garner enough funds that when you get an excuse that a kid picks up your phone call, if you're Mike Norvell, you've got quite separately from the coaching staff, of course, quite separate worlds, but you've got an NIL incentive package ready to go for that player, and they're going to take your call. Maybe that's what it's about, is September puts you in a position to where if you raise money well enough between now and then, you can capitalize and take it and get a kid to say yes to your NIL deal because that will be what puts you over the top. You know, I think what's fascinating is the idea, Tom, that the fan base has a mindset, a collective mindset. Um, they, they, the mind, uh, I think if, if we were judging what that is, it's that Norvell has to take this massive step forward. He's got to win eight games this year. Some people won't be satisfied unless it's nine games, whatever that might be. But we don't know what the university's mindset is, what Mike Norvell's mindset is, and what the money people think. Now, I know that most of the big-time money people uh, like Norvell. They do. They like him a lot. They've been willing to exercise patience. They understand that he inherited, inherited it a nightmare uh, and that these things take time. Nobody is interested in starting over yet again. They also are a group of people that are well aware of Florida State's uh, prestige and where they would like them to get back to. So if you pulled those people, they might think something t- very different. They might, because they like Mike, because he's garnered good relationships with them. They may look at this as he can go seven and five, six and six. I don't think that would get him fired. I've said it before. It would make him a dead man walking, but it didn't, it wouldn't lead to his firing. There are those out there who cover this program who believe that this year is a year that a move could be made. Um, and, and that if he went five and seven, he could get fired. I don't know what a magic number is. I'm, I'm not sitting across from Mike Alford having this discussion, nor am I sitting across from a few of the major money people. I don't know what they think. I don't know what they believe. Is there a magic number or is it more about how the team plays, uh, both good or bad, and, and what leads to that total? Yes. So what I'd say is, and again, I, I'm not speaking for Mike Norvell, I, or Mike, Michael Alford, excuse me, either in his thought process, but it's at least from our perspective on the outside, more plausible that a move could be made this year because of the actions we've seen from the athletic director to this point. And he's, he's quick to punch guy when it comes to negotiations and or making things happen, either elevating, raises, terminations, whatever it is. He seems to be a a quick-to-act person. And so if it's even in the realm of possibility for Michael Alford, I would think that the chances of this year being the end have to increase based upon what we've seen, what's publicly consumable, which is what he's done with other sports, right? Again, again, though, that conversation is a little different. I I agree collectively with the mindset, but what I would tell you is this was a no-brainer. You had a candidate who was a candidate that everybody agreed upon and had Florida State ties and wanted to come back here. That that made perfect sense. If Florida State has to fire Mike Norvell at the end of this year, who's the guy waiting in the wings that you know you can get that's going to make the change palatable? That's going to make starting over palatable. That's well, going to make you know that that's this not the same thing. I agree, but I think in that instance he would say, and again, this is like a deep role playing for Mike Alford, but it would be it's my guy. That's his answer. It'd be it would be my coach, and yeah. I'm not going to get fired at Florida State because I I went on too long with something that clearly just wasn't going to work. Was it middling? Yes. Was it getting better incrementally? But was it getting better fast enough? No. And again, he might not. He might listen to this whole segment and laugh and say, "Man, if he goes six and six or seven and five, that's fine. That's showing incremental progress, and that's good enough for me." I, I don't know where he stands on the issue. I'm just saying you have to consider it as more of a real possibility that maybe a change could be made or some aggressive step could be taken this off season because you know Alford has been willing to do that in the other sports and two very different to- things. Yeah, you're right. Two very different things. The the fans mindset is 6 and 6. Uh he's lost all support. Uh I I there's no doubt. Uh I, I there would be very the percentage of Florida State fans that would be supporting Mike Norvell if he goes 6 and 6 this year is going to drop below 
I, I think if you were just going to randomly poll Florida State fans at different parts of the state, let's say if you're visiting your parents or something and you ran into a knoll and you asked him about Mike Norvell, if he goes six and six this year, they'd be like, yeah, well, we're screwed until we get this slap dick out of here. That's exactly what he's going to think. And I believe that it's a very different conversation if it's eight and four, obviously. But what Alfred's thinking or the big boosters are thinking, I, I don't know. It could very well be you guys are nuts. If he goes seven and five, we're going to be in heaven. You just got to ask that question in code when the season's over at the end of every month. Like, how willing are you to go to Orlando for next year's kickoff against LSU? And then, yeah. very likely, likely, not likely, no way, no how. Like, just send that out every few games and see what the fans' response is because they're actually telling you how they feel about where the program is going, whether or not they want to deal with I drive and all that nonsense that well, we're going to have you, next you year. You remember, by the way, Tom, we found out, man, that the, the gate matters. Yes. Fans, fans will, will, they'll talk to you now. They'll make those decisions a little bit easier for an athletic director. Um, we, th those, those gates matter big time. Let's do some probable. Shall we fire away, buddy? It's time for how you say with the pitching uh, probables. <laughs> Before I get to probables, I see live spectators that if Norvell fails, desperation sets in. Lane Kiffin is more of a possibility. <laughs> You're right. When desperation sets in, who knows? Yeah, I suppose. Um, Mets, Marlins, Tawan Walker, Sandy Alcantara, Strohs, Yankees, Justin Verlander having himself a fine campaign, Luis Severino, Red Sox, Guardians, Nick Pavetta, Cal Quantrill. We got the Pirates and the Rays, Mitch Keller, Jeffrey Springs. I would have loved to have gone down there this weekend, but alas. Dodgers, Braves, Julio Urias and Ian Anderson, Nats, Rangers, Paolo Espino or Espano, Dave Dunning. We've got the A's and the Royals, Cole Irvin, Zach Grinky. Boy, that Grinky is just out here sucking. Rockies, Twins, Herman Marquez, Dylan Bundy. We got the Orioles and the White Sox, Austin Voth and Michael Kopech. Uh, Blue Jays, Brewers, Alec Manaya and Adrian Howard. Cubs, Cards, Kyle Hendricks, Andre Palante, Mariners, good name. Mariners, Angels, Chris Flexen, Michael Lorenzen, Tigers, D-backs, Ronnie Garcia, Merrill Kelly, Phillies, Padres, Aaron Nola, Mackenzie Gore, Reds, Giants, Graham Ashcroft, and Alex Cobb, the insufferable Graham Ashcroft and Alex Cobb. And that is a look at those that shall reside on the bump. <laughs> By the way, um, I, I think that's kind of funny. Uh, when we when we have a full slate like this, if I'm going to be locked in the house for three days, Tom, I'm thank goodness baseball has got me covered. There's 150 games tonight. Yeah, you got one more at minimum hockey game, so maybe uh, something can good something good can come of it tonight at eight o'clock on ABC, and uh, they can start defying the odds. But if they don't, you've got baseball wall to wall, and hey, you got the Travelers Championship as well. I'm watching it right now, in fact, and I'll give you a, a, a stat. Oh, really? Yeah, it's on over here on the left-hand side. McElroy's at minus 11. Um, but I will I will tell you something, uh, Tom. I um, I saw a stat today for Xander Schauffele. In the tournament, up to this point, and I think he's played something like close to the 36 holes that he needs to play for the two days. You know what his greens and regulation percentage is? What do you think it is? Well, it's either really good or really bad. I'm going to go with really bad, uh, 27%. No, it's really good. It's oh. 97%. Oh, wow. <laughs> 36 holes of golf, and my man said 97% greens and regulation. You go to hell, Xander Schauffele. That is ridiculous. Oh, sad that you tell me we're out of here. Good work out of you, sir. Thanks for watching and listening, everybody. We appreciate you. I'll be back with you on Monday. Take care.